Hey, Fedheads, welcome to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. This is Sharing Our Pairings, episode 53, Lambic Time. That's been our most popular request from the community, and we've decided to deliver. So if this goes south, it's all your fault. We're broadcast around the world in the Armed Forces Radio Network, also on the CigarFederation.com network, on YouTube, on Android, on iOS. You can find our podcast pretty much everywhere. All you need to do is search for Sharing Our Pairings, and you'll find it somewhere. I'm your host, John the Cigar Surgeon, and I'm joined, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Robbie Rass. Rob, what's going on, brother? Uh, things are good, man. Um, I, I think the community might hate us a little bit, which is why this was the number one pairing uh, suggested. We um, we put up a thread on CigarFederation.com and asked people what pairings they wanted to see, and uh, Lambix was right up there, which if you're tuning into the show, I'm guessing that you're familiar with what Lambix are. They're, I mean, they're basically fruit beers. Uh, and uh, this is going to be really interesting because we haven't done anything like that. The closest thing that we've done to this uh, was the uh, Hard Cider Show, which from all accounts did not go well. So I think that was, not a, that was not a quality show, unfortunately, or quality pairing. <laughs> I think that from, from what I've heard, we posted some stuff up around on Facebook telling people about the show. And um, somebody on Facebook told me that the uh, Blind Man's Bluff, which I am uh, currently smoking, um, Paired really well with uh, a raspberry sour from Avery's. So uh, I'm curious if this raspberry one's going to work. I have a feeling the cassis pairing is going to be pretty decent. Uh, the peach pairing scares me. Well, I've cheated and I've already had some of the Lambics because the uh, girlfriend loves Lambics and she tore into my first batch. And so I ended up getting a sampling and having to go for a second batch of Lambics to the store. But the uh, I can tell you the black currant is an excellent Lambic. Uh, the framboise or framboise, as you would say if you spoke proper French, is uh, also quite tasty. The peach, eh, maybe not so much. A um, little bit about this, what we're smoking tonight. I'm smoking a fantastic cigar. This is the Acme Route 66. This is the hot rod size, or in a classic cigar vernacular, it's a 5x50 Robusto. Uh, the reason I went with this is because we're kind of going with Habana wrappers. In my mind, I, I felt like Habana wrappers would be the ideal pairing for Lambics. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but what can you do? So this is an Ecuadorian Cuban seed amano. Uh, it features Jalapa Criollo binder, which is kind of interesting. Also features Nicaraguan San Andreas and Dominican fillers. So it's got a lot going on. I haven't smoked the Route 66 Classic before. I did smoke the Ecuadorian and I thought that was fantastic. So far I'm only about maybe, you know, half inch in and so far so good. Um, yeah, we, we uh, talked about doing <clears> – <throat> um, sorry, I totally just lost my train of thought. Habano wrappers. And uh, surprisingly enough, I didn't have one of those um, Acme Route 66. I could have sworn I had a few of them, but I, I didn't. I looked through my humidor and I didn't see it. So um, I'm not sure if we post a review of that or not. Uh, so I went with the uh, Blind Man's Bluff from Caldwell Cigars. Uh, this is actually the Corona Gorda size, which is uh, an exclusive to Burns Tobacconist in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, and I think they just they just released these in December, I think is when they got them. Um, so just some background. On the, I know we did a review. John, you posted the review of this cigar. I did. Uh, not, this, not this exclusive size. I'm going to have a review coming up uh, in the next week or so um, on this one. And they're doing some construction next door, so I apologize for any background noise. I'll try to mute as much as possible. Um, background on the cigar. Uh, it consists of some Dominican San Vicente Viso and Honduran Criollo Generoso Lajero fillers. Lajero. Uh, show us your Lajero. Show us your Lajero. Uh, have we not made that shirt? We talked about that like three years ago. Um, anyway, uh, Honduran Criollo binder and Ecuadorian Habano wrapper. Um, it's produced out of, wow. I can't even say it. Hashtag awkward. Yeah, it's in uh, in Honduras. Uh, it's a Davidoff owned factory, but it's Agroinsters. <laughs> we'll have to get Robert on the show and he can tell us. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. I should have tried to read that beforehand. <laughs> anyway, um, but this cigar came out IPCPR, three different patolas. Uh, and uh, from what I understand, it was pretty successful. I know, John, you gave it a uh, five pack rating. Yeah, uh, it was a great cigar. Um, and so far, it's kind of spicy. It's got. With this uh, Corona Gorda size, which I love this size. I mean, it's a five and three quarters by 46. Like, this is this is almost a perfect size for me. Um, I just, uh, I like that 46 ring gauge. And uh, the wrapper on it's kind of nice and oily. 
but um, a lot of spice up front on this mm -hmm. one. Some rich notes on the on the, the tongue, a little bit of leather, some earth, some woody notes. Uh, but again, I'm only what do they say half inch in. But uh, mm -hmm. so far, so good. And I think you're right with this uh, idea to pair with Habano um, wrappers for something that's got a little bit more kick to it, a little bit more spice, and try to offset some of the sweetness that we're going to encounter here. Um, let's just jump in. Let's get let's this jump in. Let's just get the peach out of the way. All right. Well, before we do that, I'm going to talk a little bit about gooses and lambics for our audience who maybe aren't familiar with it because I wasn't really familiar with lambics and gooses until a few months ago when I went on a tear uh, doing a doing a lambic show or lambic pairing event and it was a big introduction for me I had no idea before going in so a goose is actually a type of lambic and people might out there might, might be familiar with gooses it's a, it's a subset of the lambic lambic is kind of the the style of beer it's produced in a very small region in Belgium, and that region is called the Land. And they only produce between October and April. So it's a very, very specific pr production cycle. The What makes this sort of style very, very unique, or just unique because something can't be very unique, it's simply unique or not. It, it I uses like I have that discussion every week. Every week. I got to stop saying very unique because it's not very unique. It uses wild airborne yeast. So instead of, for all the beer heads out there, of course, you know how beer is made. You add yeast to a, to a vat, you create a wart, you ferment that, and that's how you make beer. Well, they don't put yeast, there's no yeast strain that's added to that wart. That yeast comes from the air. Literally, they open a big vat to the air, they leave it until they get enough yeast, or uh, yeast and bacteria, actually, and that's it. That's how they make the beer. And then they let it ferment, they store it in barrels and then it sit and sits in barrels for like maybe up to three years. And then to round it out, they'll add some fruit. They'll add, uh, I think they add a, a small amount of unmalted wheat just to sort of round out the body there. But that that's it. Like that's, you know, it's, it's a very interesting, unusual style of beer. It's pretty counterintuitive when uh, you're talking about making beer. Um, after going through my first, and this is going to come up a lot in the next few shows, so just deal with it. Uh, except I bottled my first batch last weekend, and I'm nice. very. Uh, but when you're going through that process and you're heating up the wort, then you're chilling the wort, and then you're you're gonna uh, you're getting ready to to put the to pitch the yeast in there. I mean, you have to be very careful that you're not getting airborne microbes and things like that in the beer. So they're doing the exact opposite. They're just saying, "Hey, guys, come on, it's a party." That's that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, like, and I'm sure now that you're doing your own brewing, you know. It's it's a simple thing, at least in practice. It's not so simple in 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 actual production. So to to hear somebody just basically, and it, obviously it's more complex than just opening the roof and saying, "Come on, yeast, jump into the vat." But at the end of the day, that that's exactly what it is. They're just saying, "Come on, yeast, jump in the vat," and then we'll just bottle that, or we'll you know ferment it and then bottle it. But it's it seems very counterintuitive. Yeah, it's it's an interesting process. Um... When I, I'd never really looked into the process behind it, so that was when you were explaining it. It's the first time I've heard that. Um, it's interesting. And, but, and the first thing that pops into my head was, well, they're just letting the beer do whatever they want to do because it doesn't really matter what it tastes like. They're going to throw a bunch of fruit in there anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, th I, that's not really correct, but um, that was the way my, my brain took it because when you start getting different uh, – that's that's where you're getting those off t off flavors in beer when you're when you get too many different microbes and things like that or things aren't sanitized and you're introducing things into your beer that uh, that shouldn't necessarily be there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm I'm looking at the the site here and I looked on the bottles because I don't see um, an alcohol statement on these bottles. They're there. They're just hidden. It's hidden. Uh, yeah, it's like it's at the very back and because I went through this with the girlfriend, it's it's. And of course, now I can't find it, but I think it works out to about three. It's either three point two or three point four percent. It's very, very low. Yeah, because I was I pulled up the website because we're we pulled up their uh, their site for information. It's just uh, Lindemans dot be, um, and I, I was getting prepared because I know you don't have the Frambois. You have a different a different version, um, and it's two point five percent. That's really low. Yeah, I mean, talk about a session drink, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, based on the alcohol level, they're they're a little. These are a little too sweet for me to go uh, 
to go all buck wild on. And I, I'm I'm speaking as though I don't really enjoy uh, lambics, and I, I do. Uh, and in fact, I would probably enjoy all of these. I just don't know how well they're going to pair. Uh, but it, uh, much like you were saying with your girlfriend, my wife is excited for the leftovers tonight. So, by the way, just uh, throwing it out there, it is my birthday tomorrow. Really? Yeah. You mentioned this before. Well, happy uh, early birthday. Thank you. I can't say belated because I'm not late yet. But that's right. Ho hopefully, this isn't a crappy pairing for my birthday. That's all I got to say. Yeah. So, are you taking tomorrow off and just going to rage or what? No, nope, I'm going to rage on Saturday. I'm going to go to a, a nice little brew house here and, and rage it, drink everything dark like my soul. But I'm, I'm getting way off topic. We're just going to hop right in. I'm, I'm, I, could, I could talk about everything and not talk about peach. I'm kind of avoiding a peach. This is a peach lambic. We're both drinking the same peach lambic. It's from Lindemans. Um, did you, do you have anything written down about, about Lindemans or can I just wax? No, I, I just assumed that you were going to take the lead on that. All right. Well, Lindemans has been making Lambic since 1822. They've got six generations. Uh, I'm going to do a terrible pronunciation because I cannot speak Dutch or Belgian or whatever. It's it's like it's a weird mix of German and French, and I think it's Belgian. But the original guy's name is uh, Jus Franz Lindemans. So that's obviously where the company name comes from. And through six generations, now passed down to Dirk and Geert in 2006 and also the same year they started exporting to China and in 2013 they undertook a project to expand the brewery they're doubling their their size they can increase maturation which is pretty significant and we are drinking the peach lambic so while I take a sip you can uh, talk about your cigar um, you know it's funny when you say that they've been doing this since 1822 it says it right there on the bottle uh, you can't miss it um, I mean it's right there see since 1822 uh, when it comes to lambics, at least in my neck of the woods, Lindemans is it. Yeah, I didn't see anything else, and I looked a little bit. Um, I mean, we, I knew we wanted three for the show, so uh, my goal was to go and find three. And uh, I walk into Bevmo, and I, I, I kind of know where they are. And there's the lambic section, which is you know. Here's a row that's got all the big bottles, and here's a row that's got the small bottles, and it's just Lindemans. I looked around, and there was nothing else hidden in there. Uh, I know you managed to find another company that makes them, but uh, <clears throat> they seem to be the only uh, name in town, at least around here. Um, and they've got a few different we, – we ended up with basically the, the exact same stuff. There's other options out there. There was Apple, and there was um, – I want to say Pear. Mm -hmm. um, the Pear is no bueno. Yeah, there was a couple of different things. I went with the ones that I thought would be good with cigars and peach because it was in the small bottle. I didn't want to buy the 750 milliliter bottle. Yeah, it's a big commitment. But no, I'm digging this cigar, man. It's got, um, you asked me to talk about the cigar and I didn't. Um, nice burn. And uh, it's got a real nice spice to it, which is the main thing that I'm getting out of it now. And there's kind of leathery, woody undertones that are kind of the backbone of the uh, of the flavor profile, I call them undertones, but they're a little more uh, prominent than that. But uh, nice spice up front, and so far, uh, so good. So I'm going to find my mouse here because uh, I lost it. But just a reminder to audience that you're tuned into Sharing Our Pairings, episode 53, broadcast on the Armed Forces Radio Network and on CigarFederation.com. We are tuned in. You are tuned in to the Lambic Show. It is Lambic time. We are pairing some Habano wrapper cigars with various Lambics. Talk a little bit about my Acme 66 Classic. This is also quite good. I think the nice thing I like about a Habano wrapper is it's not so in your face like a Connecticut Broadleaf. I mean, Connecticut, Connecticut Broadleaf is just slap you in the face with that, you know, big spice, big earth, big leather. And then, you, you, you know, between the draws, all you're really tasting is like leather and dirt. And I like it. It's enjoyable, don't get me wrong. But not really the right thing to pair with a Lambic. Even being fruit forward, it's probably not going to get much flavor into the mix there versus this uh, this acme route 66 which is as you say it's got a little bit of spice and as it progress here the spice is kind of falling off it's a little bit more balanced there's a great creamy woody undertone to it and then there's a little bit of spices not like pepper but actual baking spices that come through at the end of the draw it's a nice you know it's a medium plus it's it's a medium plus smoky experience but it's not in your face it's not blasting my profile away it's it's quite enjoyable i'm very much enjoying this cigar what's the price point on those <clears throat> i might be throwing you under the bus because i don't know if you have that info in front of you but i, I, I 
I think I, Tom was saying on our on our interview, and I I remember it being not very much money. They're, yeah, they're in like the five to six dollar range. I think it was five to six bucks. Now you have to double check on our on his website and go to acmecigarcompany.com and check out the cigar there. But yeah, they were very affordable when I was looking them up for the the uh, review that he did in the Ecuadorian. I think the uh, Cigar Federation store has them. Uh-huh. Uh, Hashtag see. buy now. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull it up here while we're uh, while we're talking without wasting too much time. Yeah, the, the Acme Route 66 is uh, prices start at five dollars and ninety cents. That's crazy so for uh, you know one. I don't know what. Oh, for the the robusto which you're smoking. The hot rod. Uh, yeah, a five pack for twenty nine bucks. That's crazy. I mean, yeah. a, a a boutique <clears throat> hand rolled cigar that tastes good, really good. For under six bucks, that that's nuts. And Acme Cigars, the guys behind Acme are the same guys behind uh, AKA Cigars, uh, and we know that their product is good. So, um, you know that you're getting some good stuff. With this, uh, with this blind man's bluff, the price point is uh, seven fifty for a single stick. Looks like they come in boxes of twenty. And again, uh, available exclusively at Burns Tobacco, a uh, Burns Tobacconist in Chattanooga, Tennessee. But I believe they sell online. So Chattanooga. Yeah, if you're intrigued by uh, this blend and you want to check out this size, that's the only place to get it. But I know that they uh, – I'm pretty sure they ship. So, um, yeah, so far I've taken a few uh, a few pulls on the uh, on the peach – the peche. Uh, peche. Peche lambic. And it's not that bad. No, it's not that bad. I, I was expecting it to be really peach forward just to hold it up. See, it's kind of the color of apple juice, really. I was expe- expecting it to be very, very peach forward. And instead, what I get, it's very effervescent with – sort of a muted it, it's almost i think someone in the website kind of or in the chat at cigarfederation.com mentioned that it's um a little bit like uh there's a there's another style of beer uh it's not a lambic where you mix fruit and uh beer together and i can't remember the name of it now for the life of me but it's it's kind of rem- reminiscent of that there's a few different styles of that type of beer out there and this kind of reminds me of that yeah it's it's surprising i mean when you smell it and <clears throat> i mean this looks like a very specific kind of test, by the way. Uh, the no. Uh, <laughs> um, bad joke the, for radio. <laughs> yeah, it is a bad joke for radio, actually. Um, when you're when you smell it, it smells like a Jolly Rancher. I mean, yep. it is peach, sweet, sweet peach. Um, but like you said, yeah, it, it's more effervescent. That that uh, that tartness hits the sides of the tongue pretty uh, pretty hard. Uh, with every sip, but it's almost like you're cleansing your palate in between, in between puffs of the cigar because the flavor of this doesn't linger. No, so, yeah. Trip Trip mentioned it's a Rattler, and I've I've enjoy, I enjoy Rattlers in the summertime, but a Rattler is really a mixture of fruit juice and beer versus a Lambic, which is made from scratch from ground up. But it it is reminiscent of a Rattler to me. So you know, unlike a, a Goose. Just so that people understand my Canadian pronunciation, a goose is not a ghost. Goose, ghost, goose, ghost. And a, a goose is very, very, I find them very sour, very sour forward. You know, it's sourdough in a glass for me. And sometimes that's a little much versus this lambic, which I think the, the and the point of the fruit really is to balance out that wild yeast. And I think in this case, it, 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 it it's good. Yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> what these remind me of is a shandy. Um, and maybe that's the same rattler. I, I've never heard of that. Uh, maybe we're talking about the same thing. Um, but the you know those summer shandies that are coming, and you get them in different citrus flavors and things, uh, just fruit juice and beer. Um, yeah. Similar profile here, but this has a nice dry finish to it, and uh, I'm kind of surprised. If uh, if this is the if this is the uh, the floor, then we're gonna actually be good on the show. Yeah, I'm gonna pop my second pairing here. Woo! Just so that it doesn't blow all over me when I pour here. But, um, I mean, I, what I was looking for is something that's contrasting. So these are these are opposite flavors of the cigar. They're not complementary to the cigar, really. But it works. It's just not blowing me away. I, I think it works a lot better than some of the other pairings we've had in the past that haven't worked. So I would say it's totally doable. Probably wouldn't be my top 10 pairings, but it's not horrible. Yeah, it's funny. Um expectation is is such a big thing and my expectations for this were basement level low 
So anything that doesn't taste like bile, I'm going to say, wow, I'm kind of surprised. So, uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. Um, it's, I mean, to me, it's just like each, each sip of this is a nice little palate cleanser in between each puff. I don't feel like it enhances the cigar at all. Uh, I don't feel like it takes away from it at all. Um, and the Lambic is just kind of doing what it's doing. So in a way, we're pairing them, but they're staying very separate. They're roommates who never talk. They, they live together. They exchange money. But at the end of the day, they're not friends. Yeah, yeah, basically. They just kind of tolerate each other. So that's, that's uh, maybe tolerate the long term. But, um, yeah, it's not bad. But, again, I'm not going to, you know, run out and buy a, a bunch of these Peche Lambics just to keep the pairing going. So I'm trying to take pictures for Untapped here, which is super unprofessional. But, you know, i got to get my Untapped in. Uh, so we, we're going to jump into the next, uh, the next pairing here. Uh, John and I both have Raspberry. Uh, but I stuck with the whole Lindemann's theme because, as I said before, uh, they've got a monopoly going here, in, uh, or at least at my bed bone. So, uh, as you can see, same packaging. You know, there's a rock there. Mm -hmm. And just for a heads up, they have uh, bottle caps, but they also have a cork. So you need uh, you need a little bit of both uh, to get that open. Um, some background, which was, bit, which was a bit of a surprise as the show started. We both kind of looked and we're like, "Oh, it's got a bottle cap. Popped a bottle cap. It's got a cork." Uh, I don't, I don't have a corkscrew out of my setup, so run inside, get a corkscrew. Yeah. Um, so a little bit of this, some background on the the Frambois. Uh, they add thirty percent pure raspberry juice to their lambic. Um, this one has been around. This particular uh, has, particular flavor has been around since nineteen eighty. Um, 2.5% alcohol, dark pink with slightly pink foam head is, uh, is the appearance. And as you can see, they've got the, the dark pink, uh, pretty well nailed. It's hard to tell with this lighting, but, um, it's pretty dark pink. And there's mine's a little, a little bit lighter than yours, but definitely has some foamy, a lot more foamy, I think, than the peach for me. Yeah, definitely. More of a head there. Absolutely. Um, let's see. There's, <laughs> they've got some interesting stuff on their website. A conversation tip, uh, is the bottle should be stored on their sides. Now I actually know the answer as to why they should be stored on their sides. John, would you like to know why they should be stored on their sides? I would Rob. I like to be educated on stuff and this is a cool opportunity I think for both me and the audience to get educated. So, uh, fire it at us. Well, when you use cork, <clears throat> you don't want your cork to dry out. So storing it on the side keeps the liquid near the cork, keeps your cork moist. It's not going to dry out that way. It's going to hold its seal for as long as you have that product stored. And it's not a bad idea to do that with just about anything that's got a cork in it. Uh, Except what's the thing you shouldn't do it with, Rob? Um, oh, well, now I'm under the bus. What should I not store on its side mm -hmm. that has a cork? Whiskey? You got it. Yeah, that was my guess. Was whiskey. Yeah, it's, it's it, bourbon and whiskey. The ABV is so high that it'll it'll eat right through the cork. Yeah, that's you know it's funny. I've actually got a bottle of bourbon that was sent to me. Sorry, it's not bourbon. It's whiskey that was sent to me uh, by a member of Cigar Federation from a uh, distillery that I know nothing about. But this is from the bottles from their second batch, and mm -hmm. I just I just haven't been able to bring myself to open it. And a buddy of mine was telling me, if you're not going to open it, you should store it on its side. <laughs> so he was wrong. <laughs> He's very wrong. Yeah, you store it on your side, you're going to have bits of cork in your whiskey mm. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. At any and, rate. Yeah, and I, let me see if there's any more uh, pertinent information here. Um, it's got powerful raspberry aromas with a hint of caramel and a slightly bitter finish, um, which is characteristic of all uh, – of all – uh, Lambics <laughs> smells smells like a pretty girl's hair. Um, um, that, that was a little bit weird. Um, food pairings, uh, mm -hmm. endive salad, and I actually, my wife makes these little endive cups. And if you've had endive, it's really really bitter. Um, just so it's like a bitter little leaf, and she puts some uh, blue cheese in there with a walnut and drizzled it, drizzled it with a, just a little bit of honey. Oh, forget about it. It's good. But I can see why you'd want to pair this with endive. Um, and desserts, chocolate fondue cake, ice cream, blah, blah, blah. Um, and the serving temperature is two to three degrees centigrade, which is how many freedom degrees, John? 
Uh, that would be around 34 to 35. So freezing is 32 freedom degrees. So that's zero degrees centigrade. So uh, what does it say, two? Two to three. So that, yeah, that'd be about 33, 34. That's surprising to me. That that seems way oh. too cold. I would I would think you'd probably want to serve it around 36 to 38. Yeah, but what do I know? <laughs> 36 is actually where I have my, one of my fridges set because that's as warm as I can get it. <clears throat> Any colder and it starts freezing things and you don't want that to happen. Um, so tell me a little bit about yours. I imagine we're kind of running along the same specs, but break it down. We, we are. the. I'm drinking the uh, Browridge Boone, which is a different brewery. Uh, they've been open since 1975, so they don't have quite the same history as, as Lindemann's, but um, they, they've been run by Frank Boone, one of the pioneers of uh, authentic Lambic, and they also make gooses as well. A little bit about them. Um, technically, the brewery dates back to 1680, um, it was run as a farm brewery and a distillery in the village of Lambique, Lambique, pardon me. And uh, now, um, now his son Rene is apparently running production and uh, doing a lot of goose lambics. So unfortunately, uh, or pardon me, Rene was. Uh, I got this out of order. Rene was one of the uh, people that owned it before Frank, but Rene had no uh, kids to pass it along to, so he passed it along to Frank Boone. Now. I'm, I'm definitely, as you were describing the nose, I'm definitely getting the nose. Like it, it's very, you know, it's, you know, the, the sort of toy strawberry shortcake, like the strawberry shortcake toys that smell like artificial strawberry, or artificial raspberry. That's what I'm getting off the nose. So like it smells like raspberry, but it smells like fake raspberry, if that makes sense. I mean, it's definitely a, a raspberry scent, but when I taste it, it's more in the goose category than the lambic category in, in in the case that it's very, very sour. And I wasn't expecting that. This one's from 2013, at least when it was, uh, I, I'm not sure if that was when it was bottled or when it was, uh, when it was put in the cask, but um, I'm going to take a few more sips here and see if I can get my head wrapped around it. Cause it's, it's way different. This is um, actually 5% ABV, which is surprising because uh, the rest of these are way lower than that. Yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's uh, an imperial... Uh, an imperial, <laughs> imperial lambic. <laughs> uh, so I'm getting kind of the same experience that you were talking about. Um, this one is, it's a lot more flavorful, and the flavor tends to linger a bit longer. Um, <clears throat> that, that tartness hits the sides of the tongue, as you would expect, um, but it, it, it hits them... A little bit harder and it lasts a little bit longer uh, than the than the peach. The peach was pretty quick, and then that flavor starts to die away. But you're right; it's got that <clears throat> that raspberry flavor that has a synthetic quality to it. Um, like when you talk about like a cherry, a piece of cherry candy, like a cherry uh, Jolly Rancher. That doesn't taste like real cherries. No, but it tastes like cherry candy, which is you know a flavor that we've come to expect. Um, in a way, this kind of has a similar uh, a similar deal to that. This is it tastes like raspberries, but like raspberries on I don't know steroids or something. Um, but uh, it's got a nice mouthfeel to it. It's nice and crisp. Doesn't linger too long. Um, <clears throat> it it, uh, it it's almost serving that palate cleanser uh, role that the, the peach was, but there's a bit more flavor there. I don't know if I like it better. I like it better as a beverage on its own. Um, this I've had before, and I could sit down with an entire one of these and drink it and be happy. Um, but uh, I'm not sure how I feel about the pairing. Yeah, interestingly enough, I think the peach, and this is how the show always goes, is I was thinking the peach was going to be by far the worst. And actually the peach to me is much better because the, the fruit is a little bit more forward, but not so forward that it's overwhelming the palate. Whereas with the frambois, the fruit is not as forward as I would want it to be. And instead the Lambic quality is coming through and it's again, more in the goose quality where it's, it's kind of that sour sourdough, which I enjoy, but as a pairing with this cigar, maybe not the best thing. Just reminding our audience that you are tuned into sharing our pairings, episode 53 Lambic time broadcast on the armed forces radio network and around the world on cigarfederation.com and every device that connects to the internet. You can even download it on podcasts through any one of the numerous podcast apps offline. Listen to your car on the way to work. We are pairing some Habana wrappers with some fantastic Lambics, although this one may be falling a little bit short. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> this is kind of, this is delivering for me the experience that I was really expecting um, <clears throat> going into the show. They're very, very separate. 
their uh, flavors don't do anything to enhance the other. Um, and really, I was just kind of hoping for something that's that's not going to get in the way of the other thing. Um, I don't think the cigar is getting in the way of the, the Lambic. I don't think that the Lambic is enhancing the cigar in any way or really affecting the flavors. But this, this raspberry does linger a bit longer. Um, and I mean, it's been a while since I've taken a sip and I can still taste it on my tongue. It wasn't like that with the peach. The peach was much more dry. Um, so on your Lambic, you're finding the raspberries a lot more prominent? Is that right? Yeah, it's the, the, that raspberry flavor is lingering longer um, than I was getting on the peach. Uh, I don't think, I think ours, our, 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 uh, our frambois tastes very different. Yeah, I think so. <clears throat> I think uh, mine's a bit more, it's still got that dry quality to it, but it's, it's lingering a bit more. But the, the peach is, or peach, the, uh, the raspberry is very pronounced. It's not, a, it's not a hard to find raspberry flavor. I mean, it's pretty fruit forward. It's interesting. Yeah, my my frambois is a little bit of fruit initially, and then it almost immediately drops right off, and is replaced by the like I said, it's it's that sourdough goose flavor. If you've ever had a goose, it's unmistakable. It's it's the sourness. Now it's not super sour like a lot of gooses I've had, where it just makes your lips pucker, but it takes over at sort of the middle of where you're tasting, and then it finishes with that sourdough vinegar kind of quality, and to be honest, I feel like you could step the fruit up in this particular lambic significantly and not run over the the quality of the of the beverage. It's yeah. um yeah, I mean on its own, like you said, on its own, I'm sure it'd be great. But I think paired with this cigar, it's it's just it's not they're not in sync at all. Yeah, I'm kind of on the same page. I'm not getting <clears throat> that uh, that sourdough flavor. Um, I'm getting a lot more. It's it's just it's hitting a lot more of the palate, I guess, than the peach did. The peach kind of hit the sides of the tongue, and that's it, and it was gone. But this is kind of lingering. You're getting it all over. It's hitting all kinds of different places um, that I'm picking up some flavors from. So, yeah, I think I think as far as a as a beverage alone, the Frambois is better. It, it tastes better. It's got a more full flavor. Um, <clears throat> but that full flavor is getting in the way of the cigar at this point. The uh, Acme cigar, I'm about the halfway point now. It's really transitioned to be a lot more leather on the on the finish. And I think one of the things that I really enjoy, maybe not with this middle pairing, but with the first pairing, is that I think the, the fruit in the beverage cuts that leather out nicely. And I'm not a huge fan of overpowering leather. And it's not overpowering, but you know what I mean? I, I, I'm not a fan of leather post -draw. It's kind of one of those flavors I'm just not a fan of. So I think in that case lambics with the fruit that's a good balance if you're not a fan of leather it'll cut that out really nicely and as you say between the sips it's it kind of acts as a palate cleanser yeah <clears throat> i'm uh i'm losing a lot from the cigar now I, I just taste raspberry on everything which is the more that i that i drink it the more it's building up um and it's, it's definitely muddling the flavors that i'm getting it is bringing out a creamy quality in this cigar that i wasn't getting before creamy uh, but that's really about it. Like I've lost a lot of the spice. I've lost a lot of the flavor, which is unfortunate because this is a really good cigar. And this is what I was scared of, that these these flavors are going to be so tart and so pronounced and so overpowering that uh, it's really going to drown everything out. Um, I find myself reaching for the water here to cleanse my palate so I can get some of the cigar back. Yeah, I think one of the nice things for us doing sharing our pairings and spending our hard-earned money on these various beverages to pair with is that you guys at home don't have to suffer through a bad pairing. But you know what? We we always say pair where you like, so maybe you will enjoy a particular Lambic in, in cigar. For me, the, the peach was totally doable. That's something I would actually do again. The Frambois, eh, not so much. Yeah, I'm in the same boat. I, I don't know if I'm going to, like I said, run out and buy more of these peach and, and, and have it around so I can do this again um, but uh, I don't know that I would hesitate to do it again um, I'd be curious to try it with some, a different uh, a different wrapper a cigar that's got maybe a different profile um, <clears throat> just to see but yeah I think the peach <laughs> as, as we should know I should have known that the peach was gonna be probably end up being the best pairing uh, although I still have some decently high hopes uh, for the cassis um, <clears throat> but we've got a few minutes. You want to take an audience question before uh, before we go to uh, on to our next pairing here? Sure. Uh, let's pick Jeff's question. Uh, Jeff wants to know: Can John give a short review of the Acme Route 66 towards the end of the show? Well, I kind of screwed that up, didn't I? Um, 
I, I can give you a good review right now. I think this is an easy five pack buy. And based on the price, this would be a box split or even a box buy. You know, we don't really talk about cigars and we try not to rate cigars based on the price point because it's a bit of a slippery slope. But at that price point, that's a no brainer box buy. It's a 20 count box, five by 50. The Vitola is good. It smokes well. The draw is good. And at that price point, under six bucks, give me a break. Like 20 cigars, even if, even if I thought the cigar was just okay at that price point, I'm definitely buying it. And it's, it's way better than okay. Like I said, this is, a, this is a really good Habana wrapper. It's got a lot of complexity. It starts out with spiciness, gives you some creaminess, and then it just kind of evolves into a little bit more complex where everything's in balance, finishes a little bit leather. And I suspect the uh, last third will probably have a little bit more spice forward. But it's again at these price points, it's it's a no-brainer. You're not paying ten bucks for a stick. It's it's hard to not like that, especially if you're a budget-oriented shopper. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you uh, you kind of nailed it with that cigar. I've smoked that one a few times, and uh, it's quite enjoyable. All the the Acme releases, um, I think, are pretty good. Um, in the premiere, I think the the two different premiere releases, one's in one's the Ecuador, and I can't remember what the other one was off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> but those are, uh, I think, they're a bit more expensive. Um, but that Route 66 for an everyday smoke, and I, I know that term sounds so negative, um, but for guys who are smoking every day, I mean, you're not smoking ten dollars cigars every day, and if you are, well, God bless you, you're doing really well, good for you. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, like you said, budget budget conscious is uh, it's not a bad word, um, and to to get a cigar of that quality for that price point, um, that's tough to beat. You know, and, yeah. on on Fawn has a really good follow up question. On wants to know how do you find the Lambic flavors compared to the overpowering quality of the IPA? He says he always finds stouts to be the best pairing. What do you think, Rob? Um, <clears throat> so he wants to know how do the the lambics compared to IPAs, or in a, in a as far as pairing is concerned, I think he was. First of all, I just like to say I think a lot of people do find IPAs a little bit overpowering because the the hot forwardness of some IPAs is is a little off putting. But that could just be the IPA that you're that you're pairing with. We've had IPAs in the previous IPA shows, and we'll certainly have more on IPA 2.0 and 3.0. That the IPAs were not at all hot forward; they were very balanced and quite delicious. So. I think it really depends on the type of IPA you get that it's not so in your face. And I agree with on in that stouts are kind of an easy pairing, but they're only an easy pairing with a cigar that can stand up to it. So there's a whole range of cigars out there. that are just going to get run over by a stout, but um, he wants to know how Lambic is comparing to IPA. And I think what he's asking is, you know, are Lambics is overpowering to the palate as an IPA? Yeah, I would say more so. <clears throat> um, I mean, we were both, pretty uh, pleasantly surprised with the IPA shows we've done in the past. Uh, and it depends on the style of IPA, um, you know, West Coast IPA, East Coast IPA, North Coast IPA, whether that's really a term or not, but I've heard people use it. Um, you know, a sweeter IPA, uh, you know, there, there's, you know, different styles that you're going to run into. Um, <clears throat> I've found those pairings to be much more pleasant than, um, than what we're doing here. And this is why I was always kind of curious about doing a sour show. But now after doing this, I don't know that I would ever, I would want to do that. Sours are expensive. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I mean, these, these weren't, I mean, these are a couple bucks, so it's not a big deal. But if I'm out there spending 15, 20 bucks on, you know, uh, a 22 ounce uh, beer, I, I don't know if I want to jump in with a pairing, but I'm pretty sure it's not going to be good. Um, but to, to get more to the point with this question, as far as a pairing is concerned, I'm going to go IPA every day of the week. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, to say that stouts are the easiest pairing, like you said, that's a tough statement to make. Um, it depends on what you're pairing with, what cigars you've got. Um, I think that you, with pairing a stout and pairing an IPA, you're going to run into the same amount of uh, hoops to jump through to find a, a pairing that works. Um, I, I think the, the thought that uh, stouts are sweeter, darker, it just they kind of like they, they they look like a cigar. Cigars are you know kind of dark. You get a Maduro wrapper, or whatever. It seems like it makes more sense as a pairing. I don't know if it does or if it doesn't, but uh, I think they're they're just as difficult to pair as an IPA. That would be my thought. And uh, of course, uh, natural pairing, which I don't see a lot on Facebook. All the Facebook groups, people pairing Could fire cured tobacco cigar and IPA. Whoa, oh, forget about it. Yeah. Have we done a show like that? We did, right? We did. Okay. And it was a good one. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> we did the um, I did the KFC Drew Estate uh, KFC. Um, it was the the pig, the flying pig KFC, and it was fantastic. Yeah, that's right. That was the pig's flash show. And I didn't have one, so I just did the regular, uh, the regular one. But yeah, that that pairing for me, <clears throat> that makes a lot of sense. You get that uh, those salty characteristics uh, from that that tobacco is going to pair nicely with the, the hoppy flavors of uh, of an IPA. And yeah, I, I think that. I really think that you can pair just about anything if you find the right cigar. Um, but I'm going to emphasize the just about because I don't know what would pair well with this. Yeah, it's, I don't. I don't know. It's. I mean, it's kind of like. Yeah, it's it's like when we did the the uh, hard cider show. It's just a beverage that's not really going to pair with with a cigar and unfortunately there's going to be stuff out there that's not going to pair with a cigar ginger ale and cigars maybe not the way to go lambics and cigars some of them yes but you know if you do go with a hard cider eh, it's just it's too fruit forward it's too sharp on the palate it's just it's, there's so many other things you can pair with we found some things that don't pair very well but we found lots of things that pair very well just yeah. reminder to audience that you are tuned into Sharing Our Pairings, episode 53, Lambic Time, broadcast on the Armed Forces Radio Network and around the world on CigarFederation.com. We're pairing some Lambics and Habano wrapper cigars here. We should probably get into our last pairing, the Cassis, which I've, I've got high hopes for, and I hope they're not shattered. Yeah, I've, uh, I snuck a few clips, and um, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. I can uh, Let me pull up some of the information here on the Cassis. We're both drinking the same one. While you do that, I'm going to hold up the bottle. As you can see, it looks like everything else that we've been doing. And there's no ABV on the back, but I'm pretty sure it's, again, it's in the three, three and a half range. I'll hold it up. It, it definitely looks like what you would expect. You know, it's very dark, very m much more a dark fruit. And on the nose, it's it's actually a lot more pleasant, I think, than the Frambois. It's, it's more of a... Um, it's more of a blackberry current, black current kind of flavor to it or nose to it, which is really, really enjoyable. Anyway, I'm going to let you talk about the beverage while I take some sips. Yeah, go, go for it. Uh, so yeah, blackberry current um, or black current, not blackberry. Uh, black currants is what we're working with here. They've been making this particular. Wow. Uh, this, yeah, I thought the same thing. Um, they've, <laughs> uh, they've been making the cassis since uh, 1986. 3.5% alcohol by volume, so it's a little bit higher um, than the other two that I've had. Um, purplish red with an ample pink uh, creamy foam head, which mm -hmm. I, I assume that John showed that. But this, yeah, the, the head retention on this is pretty strong. Um, I mean, that's where it is from the pour, and it hasn't changed at all. Uh, it definitely has a foamy characteristic to it. A um, little more info here. The conversation tip. Store the bottle on the side. It's the same one as the others. Um, the taste, black currant aromas prevail over uh, the other scents. It tastes very sweet on the palate with a good acidity and a bold taste of black currants, um, resulting in a dry, woody note. Uh, again, two to three degrees. Pair it with cheesecake, which absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Yep. almost wonder if you could even reduce this down and make like a little uh, – syrup that you could put on top of cheesecake that would be good oh, yeah. Um, but yeah so based on your first sip i think you experienced the same thing that i did and that is that it's uh it's pretty tart it's very tart but i think one of the things that surprises me is it's almost a little bit like whiskey in that my palate needs to acclimate i apologize for all the smacking because it's 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 very sour it's causing me to pucker quite a bit but it is like whiskey to me where the initial punch in the face of sour sort of lambic goose is almost overwhelming but then when i go back for my second or third sip i'm getting a lot more of the the black current there is um there's there's almost like an, like an anise quality in there where it's it is more complex than just sort of a fruity beer there's a lot more layers to it but um i think it might be i think it just might be too much for this cigar i would agree with you that this has the depth of flavor here um, and the complexity of flavor is uh, uh, far and away, uh, head and shoulders above the other two. Uh, there are layers of flavor as opposed to just, bam, here's the fruit. Um, I'm not getting those woody notes that they're telling me that we would get at the end. Um, 
but uh, there is there it feels like there's a bit more complexity here. Uh, definitely tart. Uh, I think this is of the three that I, that we've tasted just as a beverage alone. This is my favorite. Yeah. Uh, this I would actually this I would actually buy and uh, and have around the house because I like it. And and that was like when my girlfriend stole slash borrowed my samples. That was the one that she liked the most as well. She wasn't a big fan. I can't remember what the large bottle was that we. I think we both talked about it, and I can't remember what flavor that was. But we cracked the large bottle and ended up not finishing it because it just wasn't very good comparative to the other the other two that we got. But this is by far my favorite. And what's interesting is that. It is complementing the cigar now because I'm getting a ton of sweetness out of the cigar on both the retrohale and the draw, which I'm not getting, you know, when I, my palate kind of resets, which takes a few minutes. When my palate resets, I'm not getting that off off a normal draw. I'm only getting that after I have a sip, take a, take a minute and take a puff. Yeah, I almost wonder if um, <clears throat> kind of like a nice Maduro would go better with this. Um, something with that's a... a than the cigar that I've got here. It's got a little bit more earthiness to it. Some of those chewy qualities that mm -hmm. you get out of a Maduro or like a cigar I just recently reviewed, the uh, the Crown Heads Four Kicks with the uh, Connecticut Broadleaf on it, the Black Belt Buckle. I think that might pair a little bit better. Um, that cigar is sweeter, but uh, it's got that kind of chewy uh, quality that you get out of some Maduros. And I think that that... Uh, might be a little bit more complimentary here. This is better than the raspberry as far as the pairing is concerned because, like you said, it's got some earthy quality to it. So there's a little bit of, of, of compliment going back and forth. Um, but, yeah, I, it's, 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 uh, it's unfortunate because I, I, having smoked the first you know inch or so of this cigar before we started, I got off to a really good start and I was really enjoying it. And I feel like I've kind of screwed it up with all these. <laughs> I think the, I would agree with you that in terms of beverages, this is by far my favorite because I think it strikes that right balance to me between complex fruits with multiple layers, but still containing that sour Lambic quality. The, the peach was by far the best pairing, which again, that's that's just how these shows go. We're expecting it to be the worst, and I think it's the best. And the raspberry, I mean, I'll probably have to revisit later tonight, and and maybe on a fresh palate, see if I can get more out of that. But just not my uh, not my favorite lambic, I don't think. Yeah, I think the the peach was best because it was the least intrusive. Yeah. Uh, my palate, you know, I mean, I, I, like I said, it was it was almost like drinking club soda, in while you're smoking a cigar and which uh, I, I do like to do because I feel like that it gives you a nice palate cleanser in between um, or sparkling water or something like that. And uh, that's, that was the, the feeling I was getting from that peach. The rest of these, the flavor is, is so much stronger, which I mean, for the, the beverages themselves, that's great uh, for the pairing. Not so much. Um, I do like this cassis. I actually like it a lot. Um, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'm going to revisit this and I know my wife is probably going to finish this off when she gets home. So, uh, maybe I'll have to revisit them a little bit later, but, uh, it's definitely enjoyable. They're all enjoyable. I mean, not all way. horrible, but, uh, if, if I'm looking for something, if I want a beer that's got a little bit of tartness to it, there's a bunch of different places that I would go, um, to, uh, to, to satisfy that before I would go here. So we asked for audience questions and we got them. So we've got a, quite a few minutes left on the show here. So we'll kind of blast through those. We've got another question from on. He wants to know what cigars are in everyone's humidor or easily accessible should be paired with Lambix. He wants to try this experiment. You know, uh, the, I think the Habano works. It just, it has to be paired with the right Lambic. I think you're onto something, Rob, talking about maybe a nice Maduro. Might yeah, be a good I think with, yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I think with the, um, with these ones that are more fruit forward, um, I would go with something a bit bolder in uh, with the flavor profile to combat. You know, you go strength against strength, right? So I'm thinking you got this strength of flavor and this tartness. I would combat that with um, something that's got a deeper flavor to it, uh, maybe a bit more spice, even um, more of a pepper spice. Um, something that I'm just trying to think of off the top of my head. That's uh, that's bigger and bolder, like. Uh, um, like a San Latano mm. uh, Maduro, maybe from that's a great cigar from from AJ Fernandez. You know, it would probably work out pretty well 
Well, no, maybe not. Never mind. Scratch that. Um, I mean, probably some of the stuff from Roma Craft. Yeah, uh, those are, those are big, big in your face cigars. Yeah, I think that's something that's going to have to combat this. I would suggest trying it with more of an everyday cigar than with like a special occasion smoke, um, for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I would think something something a bit heavier. Jeff, uh, Jeff has an interesting follow-up question here, which I think will get your mental juices flowing here. Jeff Madre wants to know, would any of these work as good as a mixer for liquor? Um, if, I mean, could you make a cocktail? Uh, it's kind of interesting. Make a cocktail out of anything, bro? Um, yeah. I, well, yeah, I think you could. Um, some of the stuff that pops into my head, I would rather make it with champagne. Than something like this, um, like a Cur Royale is just champagne and uh, creme de cassis. It doesn't have that same tartness to it. It's much more sweet. Um, but with these, yeah, I would suggest if you wanted to do a cocktail, it'd have to be vodka or rum based with these anyway. I mean, yeah, I was thinking a uh, vodka and then maybe some mint in there might be interesting. Yeah, I mean, when you start talking about things like that, I, some of the things that my wife and I like to just – that we always like to put into a cocktail whenever we're trying to make something new is rosemary for whatever reason. Um, it, it brings out a lot of interesting flavors. And uh, we have three huge rosemary bushes, so maybe that's got something to do with it too. But, uh, yeah, when you start getting into that type of stuff and you're bringing herbs into the equation, you're going to get a little bit uh, sophisticated with what you're doing. Absolutely. And, Jeff, I feel like that was a challenge. And I'll say challenge accepted. We'll, nice, nice. Uh, um, the wife and I will come up, we'll come up with some, uh, Lambic cocktails just for Jeff. We'll post them up on, uh, mixedandmash.com here in the coming months. That might be more of a springtime thing because those sound like more springy type cocktails, but, um, yeah, absolutely. You could, uh, you could make some cocktails out of this. On, uh, has a question. I'm not sure if this is a challenge for us specifically with the type of shows we're doing, but he wants to know where are the Lanceros? <laughs> They're all in your humidor, On. They're all in Han's humidor. Uh, if, uh, for those of our listeners out there who don't get the joke, because you'd have to be a, on Cigar Federation all the time to get it, but On is a Lancero fiend, loves his Lanceros. I don't think we've really done a Lancero pairing show, have we? I don't think we have. Off the top of my head, we're getting to the point now where it's harder for me to say, hey, remember that show when we did this because we've done so many of them? Um, and, and we... We're drinking alcohol most of the time too, so that makes it a little bit difficult. Um, Copy I think that. We could definitely do some some Lancero pairings. It gets it gets interesting though. I mean, I think that would have to be the right fit because it doesn't make sense to say, well, let's pair some Lanceros with you know these different beverages. I mean, it has to be we got to be smoking stuff that has the same uh, wrapper on it or you know whatever. Um, I mean, we could have easily done this show with a, a, a Lancero that had a Habano wrapper on it. Um, but uh, I don't know that we've done any any Lancero shows, and, and absolutely we could do some of those coming up in the future. I think for me, Lanceros tend to be a little bit pricier. Like when you look at a lineup, they're they're usually a little bit pricier because they are a pain for the rollers to make, and they're a pain for the manufacturers. They don't tend to sell well. Although Clint from Two Six Two talks about uh, he wants to make every shop in the world a Lancero shop, so you know, mad respect for that. But um, I don't know. I think the the issue in my mind is that Lanceros tend to be a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more complex. So it'd be tough to pair because you, you want to make sure you're not pairing it with something like a bourbon or, or a really heavy whiskey that's just going to blow the cigar out. So that's it's an interesting question. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> um, and that kind of goes back to the point that I was saying, if you want to try some Lambic pairings at home, um, reach for something in your cigar that's or in your humidor that's more of an everyday cigar something that's easy for you to replace uh, in case you don't like the pairing. Um, but the nice thing about any kind of pairing is if you take a couple of sips and it's not working, you could just put it down, have a couple of sips of water, and you're good to go yep. um, for the most part. But, yeah, Lancero pairings, absolutely. Let's do it. So a little bit about, because uh, we've got a lot of shows coming up. We've been really, really busy booking guests, booking Cigar Chat. So we've got a lot of guests coming on sharing our pairings in the next few months. And just a little heads up. Looking at the uh, shows coming up this week, 
because I think we've got some interesting cigar chats. You've been you've been busy booking cigar chats. So next week we've got Vivalo cigars on Thursday, or actually that's this week. That's tomorrow. That's tomorrow. Yeah, that's tomorrow. So Vivalo at eight p.m. Eastern. Uh, we've got another pipe dummies, of course, Tuesday, which is come to be a standard Tuesday show unless they cut the broadcast five minutes in. It's a pretty typical Tuesday show. And what's interesting next week is we've got a special guest and a special cigar. We've got Paul Asadorian from Stogie Geeks. He's going to be joining us at our normal early time here of 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time while it's still cold. Scotchy Scotch 2.0. And we're going to be pairing the Sobra Mesa from Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust. Yeah, that's exciting. That's a great cigar. One of the best that came out this past year um, from Steve Saka. Uh, if you're not familiar, if you haven't tried that cigar, you should definitely seek it out. I'm almost positive the Cigar Federation store has it. A bunch of places online have it. Um, great cigar. So that's going to be a fun show. Paul's a lot of fun. He knows his uh, he knows his booze, so that'll be he knows his booze. You know, I have not smoked the Sober Mesa, and I don't know that we have a review on CigarFederation.com of the Sober Mesa. Absolutely we do. And, in fact, we were the first people to review it. There you go. That's why it seems like we don't have one because we did it so long ago. When uh, we had Steve on uh, Cigar Chat, and he told uh, he told me that we were the first people outside of the factory and close friends and family to smoke it. Nice. So um, I'll take that for what it's worth. But yeah, we were the, some of the first. I think we were definitely the first people to review it. And that's if you just go up to CigarFederation.com, search Sober Mesa, you'll find that. So as as I said, I have not smoked a Sober Mesa, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have a chance to smoke it before next Wednesday show because. For my birthday, celebrating on Saturday, I'm probably going to be smoking a Padron 50th, and I'll be throwing up a review of that bad boy. Oh, big, big time. Yeah. That's big time. I haven't smoked that yet. I'm, I'm not sure anyone in Cigar Federation uh, for the mod group has smoked the Padron 50th yet, so I'll definitely be throwing that up. Thanks to uh, Havana Controls for floating me that cigar, and I'll be uh, doing a video review of that bad boy for sure because that's a uh, very special cigar that I get my hands on. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think uh, just to wrap it up here for our Armed Forces Radio Network segment, the Peach was the best Lambic for pairing, but no question that uh, that Cassis was by far the favorite of the night, I think, for Lambics. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And it's funny, I've gone back to the Peach because I still want to enjoy my cigar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, and, and like you were saying, we didn't go into to too much depth, but uh, we've got shows for sharing our pairings and guests booked out through like June, so this is going to be this is going to be a different year for this for uh, sharing our pairings. I mean, we're going to be much more consistent with. Uh, well, last year, I know we switched from weekly to bi-weekly and or bi-monthly or whatever the term is, every other week. Uh, so this this year, it's going to be much more uh, much more consistent. So that's good. Uh, when baseball season kicks off, it's going to be we're starting a little bit later, and uh, that's not my fault. It's uh, I don't schedule the games. And, there's the great really- thing about starting later, though, is that'll be the time of the year where I get my light back, so I can uh, I can smoke till midnight. Absolutely. So that's I, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. It's, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming up, so definitely want to keep uh, stay tuned in to uh, sharing our pairings and so, all of our shows really for for this year. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, make sure, you know, if you if you don't catch our shows live, because I know a lot of you guys are busy, everyone's got a life, but I, you know, I've. I've been listening to podcasts nonstop in the car. I've been checking out all the episodes of Stogie Geeks on, on my car, and I listen to our back episodes of Sharing Our Bearings and Pipe Dummies and Cigar Chat. So, you know, you can always download your local podcast and check it on the car. That's kind of my favorite way to listen now. Absolutely. And just a plug for a podcast that I have nothing to do with, a podcast called Criminal is amazing. Criminal. I'll add it to my, to my rotation. Oh, absolutely. And it's, they're all like true crime stories. They're all about 25 minutes long. And some of them are really kind of intense, and some of them are just weird. It's it's a really, really interesting show. Uh, nice. Yeah, definitely check that out. All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Sharing Our Pairings. We'll catch you next week. Make sure to catch Cigar Chat tomorrow night. It's going to be a good show. And as we always say, drink better, but drink less. And then everyone's going to think we're frozen. <laughs> but I'm telling you, man, that criminal podcast, I turned Trip onto it. He's into it. It's awesome. Like some of the shows are just crazy. They're just crazy. I I um I really like a good podcast. I, I kind of got out of the habit being unemployed for a long time there. I wasn't really listening to podcasts at home, but I, I did miss listening to a podcast on the on the drive to work or the 
commute to work or over your commuting because I think it's it's a nice way to get your head out of the commute. And I mean, obviously, you're still paying attention to your commute, but it gets you in that nice headspace ready for work where you're calm and relaxed. And I, I don't know, I, it's a it's my favorite way to listen. I think. Yeah, that's I do it. I get into them when uh, <clears throat> I'm traveling back and forth to the ballpark because I work from home, so my commute is not very long. Um, but uh, driving in and out of the ballpark, it's it's a different story and. Um, I'll do audio books uh, from Audible. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go through a lot of those. And uh, it was the Serial podcast, which is the one that really got me turned on to podcasts. And I don't know if you've listened to Serial. Uh, I haven't. I've, I've listened to a number of serialized type podcasts where there are stories that are ongoing, and I find that really, really fun and interesting. But there's a, there's a whole world of podcasts out there that you know I'm sure I've not even barely scratched the surface of. Oh, no, I, I'm telling you, look up, it's it's just called Serial, and listen to the first season, and it's a uh, whole season, it's almost uh, akin to the uh, the show that's on Netflix right now that everybody's freaking out about, the To Make a Murderer, um, it's a true crime thing about a, anyway, listen, it was, it's so compelling, um, and they're doing one now on, uh, on Bo Bergdahl, um, which is conflicting uh, for me personally, but um I won't get into that too much, but Serial is, uh, is the first season was great. Um, and, uh, and criminal. Those are the only two that I really listen to, hmm. but it, yeah, it's that true crime stuff to me is really, really interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's hard. Yeah, to, I dig it. It's hard to find it done well. And, uh, these guys do it well. So, uh, Rob, why don't you catch us up on baseball? Cause it's getting to be that time of the year where there's baseball moves. You got any new baseball news this week? Uh, not really. Um, Justin Upton signed with uh, Detroit, which I didn't really see that coming. But um, it, it was—it's kind of—we we talked about this last week. It's kind of amazing the amount of, of high-priced talent that was still available on the free agent market. You know, middle of January. Um, Cespedes, Yoni Cespedes, outfielder, is still out there. He's kind of the big name that nobody really knows where he's going to go. Um, I think he must be just asking for way too much money. Um, but they're all asking for a ton of money. Uh, I, I mean, my Giants are pretty much done unless they pull off some kind of trade to strengthen, you know, their bench or maybe their bullpen a little bit. But I think their bullpen, they've got enough young arms in the bullpen to uh, to come up. Pitchers and catchers report in about a month. So uh, it's exciting times uh, for baseball nerds. Um, I will not be making a trip down to spring training this year, unfortunately. Um, the last two times I went was uh, – 2010 and 2012, the Giants won the World Series both times. And I didn't go in 2014, but I probably should have. Yeah, I, sh- I should go this year too, you know, just keep the trend going. But You're the, you're the reason why they didn't win, and I can't believe you would do that to them. Well, they won in 14. But, um, yeah, no, it's uh, spring training. If you've never been and you're a baseball fan, just do it. I know it's expensive and it's a lot of planning ahead, and you're really just you're flying, you know, depending on where you are, halfway across the country to, to – to watch baseball, but it's so much fun. Um, it's you're seeing uh, baseball the way that, or and I feel like people saw it 50, 60, 70 years ago. You're so much closer. The the players are you run into players at restaurants, and I mean, there's there's so many of them around that it's just there's the, the level of access is so much higher. And just for just a true baseball fan, it's so much fun. And plus, it's March, and it's already like 85 degrees down in Arizona. So um, you can't beat that either. It's a lot of fun. Sounds sounds delightful. So talking about uh, NFL, because we're coming down to the Super Bowl in just a few weeks here, we had an interesting um, uh, prelim. I don't even know what you call that. Would you call it a semifinal? I don't even know what the name for the uh, – I think it was the divisional playoffs. Is that the divisional playoffs? So um, we kind of we kind of nailed that. Um, first of all, I kind of expected Kansas City originally to beat New England and move on to face Denver, and I thought they'd have a really good chance of beating Denver, but the Steelers pulled out a win against them and uh, went on to face Denver. And uh, Denver, I wouldn't say they smoked them because it was a pretty close game, but you know the way that Denver played that game, I don't think Denver's got much of a – I say this now, but I don't think Denver's going to beat New England next week. I think New England's going to beat Denver. And, uh, I mean, Denver's got a really great defense, but – Defenses keep you in games and offenses win you games. And I think New, New England's offense is just too strong to beat. Yeah, there's a reason that New England, excuse me, gets back to this point every year. Every year, no matter about injuries, no matter if they are making their offensive line out of, you know, uh, 
dough and duct tape. Um, there's a reason. And uh, I, I think I can't see any reason why they're not going to be in the Super Bowl. I'm, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, this week, uh, Bill Belichick's going to have to address some cardboard boxes at the offensive line. They're that low. <laughs> And you always hear the. And this is always after a team loses. You always hear about. Well, we had the, we had radio issues when we were playing New England, and it's kind of getting old. Um, and I don't know. Uh, and the other in the NFC, it's uh, who the hell is it? Well, the, so the NFC game was interesting yeah. because it was uh, the the Arizona beat Green Bay, and I you know there's a lot of controversy, but I think overall Arizona played a much better game and. Uh, I, I said last week I thought Arizona was going to win that game because I just saw them as a more complete complete team. And if you watched Green Bay the week before, you know, against Washington, they came out really soft and it almost looked like Washington was going to take it and then they kind of got their legs under them. But against Arizona, Arizona just played solid four quarters of football. Now it did go into overtime in Arizona, but Arizona beat them with a touchdown in, in overtime. And then uh, Carolina laid, and the score doesn't really reflect it, but Carolina laid up beating on the Seahawks. Well, they were up 31 nothing. 31 nothing, And then they just and then they just didn't score for the rest of the game. Yeah, I just kind of put it in cruise control, which can be tough against when you start playing teams like this at this point in the season, throwing it on cruise control um, might not always be the best option. Nope. Maybe just get that next touchdown. You know, thir- thirty-one's good, but thirty-eight's better. <laughs> so, so the NFC has actually played out the way that I expected, which is kind of interesting. So, it is going to come down to a Cardinals Panthers uh, finish, which you think you know both both championship games are going to be really, really good games. I mean, you can't ask for more in the AFC than New England versus. Uh, Denver that that's a great game in the NFC the Panthers versus the Cardinal I mean that's that's a great great matchup I mean yeah you've got a favorite team I've got a favorite team but honestly that's got to be the best two matchups for the championship game and I think New England's going to beat the Broncos but in the Panthers Cardinals game I I honestly don't know how to call that game I mean I want to say the Panthers because they've had such a great season but if any team could beat them I feel like it's the Cardinals yeah, I mean these are the these are the teams that you wanted to see. Just as a fan of <clears throat> the best teams making it, I know we've given Denver crap all year about not being that good, but we they must be good because they've got this far. They keep winning, mm-hmm. so I mean you can't really deny that. Um, I just that that NFC game, man, that's a hell of a game. That's that's gonna be like that's to me again you know the New England game the the Broncos that that's gonna be a good game but honestly even though I'm an AFC fan that NFC game is really gonna be the game to watch for me and I'm I'm really looking forward to that so I'm gonna throw out my predictions I'm gonna go New England and Panthers in the in the Super Bowl and I'm gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna say Panthers first Panthers are gonna win the Super Bowl. Yeah, I, I think New England. I think we'll both agree on New England. I, I don't know. I don't know who's going to win in the NFC. And frankly, I haven't watched much football this year at all, uh, really. Um, I was watching it earlier in the season, paying attention to my uh, fantasy team, which I got my, my winnings for uh, scoring the most points nice. uh, in the regular season. And there's some, there was some good stuff in there. There was uh, um, uh, the Goldie Lancero in there, which I haven't smoked. Um, I don't know if nice I threw one. that in there. I'm, I remember I threw in a bunch of really good stuff. Yeah, there was there was some nice. It was a nice selection. So um, uh, it was a pretty cool. That, that was a fun league. I mean, it was competitive and nobody gave up, which is nice. It's that's one thing you run into with fantasy is there's usually a team and we had 16 teams. So there was easily somebody could could have given up, but it didn't seem like anybody did. There might have been one or two teams that weren't paying much, much attention, but for the most part, uh, everybody was involved and. Um, with the uh, cigars that were sent in as your buy-in, um, the, people didn't send crap. They sent really good cigars. So it was. Uh, I'm glad that we did it. It was uh, fun to be a part of it. Thanks to Brett for uh, for running that league for us again this year. So one of the things I'm looking forward to. Obviously, we've got a lot of guests coming up. We've got uh, Paul Asadorian next week. We've got uh, who do we have? I'm just looking at our schedule here because we've got so many people. I think we're going to try and get uh, Matt, one of the mods here, one of the beer guys on our show. In a couple of weeks, 
what else do we have? We've got uh, Nomad. Fred from Nomad is going to be on the show in a, in, a, in a little while. Check out our event calendar at CigarFederation.com. Oh, um, of course, the big one that I'm looking forward to is Eric Hansen from Hammer and Sickle in mid-February there, just before I take off to Nicaragua. We're going to do the Kalanach, which, you know, I've been itching. I think you've, you're tired of hearing me talk about it. We're going to be doing the Kalanach. And then we've got the Casada K. We've got a lot of shows booked up. Check out the event calendar because they're all up right now. Yeah, those are the two shows I'm looking forward to the most. Um, the, and no offense to any other shows, I'm looking forward to all of them. Uh, but the, to, to smoke that Kalanach, um, the samples came in last week. And uh, it's been hard for me to not just fire one up. Mm -hmm. um, but I know we've got to do the show and we've got to do a review. So there's, there's not too many, uh, too many extra samples in there floating around um, just to smoke on a whim. But uh, that one and the Casada keg um, with Terrence from uh, Casada. Terrence, uh, Terrence knows his beer. Terrence loves his beer. So that's going to be fun. We've had Terrence on before. Um, so oh, that'll be a great fun show. show. And the Casada keg last year's version was great. I haven't smoked this year's. Uh, they've got a new band on it. It's a much nicer looking cigar. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious. I think we might even have some giveaways for that show. Um, so that's one to keep your eye on. And um, we haven't booked a date for it. And I may be speaking too early, but um, and we're kind of talking to uh, a distillery in Washington, um, Washington State. Uh, Tatoosh, I believe is how you say it. Tatoosh Distillery. Uh, and they've got, they make uh, whiskey and uh, a rye. So it'll be nice to uh, feature them. And um, the gentleman, the contact that we have there, his name is escaping me, but uh, he's a cigar guy as well. So I, I think he'll hopefully join us and can, we can kind of nerd out on some, uh, some whiskey and some rye for a day. So that'll be fun too. Lot Which is going to be kind of a twist, sort of cut you off, Rob. It's going to be yeah. it's going to be kind of a twist because normally we try to feature the cigar and feature something that you know have something we're going to pair with. In this case, we're going to be featuring a, a liquor or a spirit and finding a cigar to pair with. So it's a little bit backwards, but you know that's kind of the fun of doing sharing our pairings is sometimes we can focus on the cigar and sometimes we can focus on the spirit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and, and we've done that I think in the past with uh, we've featured a particular brewery. Um, that's true. Yep. Uh, one of my goals this year is to get someone from Stone Brewing on. Um, so they put cigar pairings for many of their beers up on their website. So it just makes sense. Um, so I'm working on getting someone uh, to come on and, and talk uh, beer and cigar pairings with us. I think that'd be a lot of fun um, to do as well. Nice. So we've got a lot of shows coming up. Make sure to check us out live or check us out on podcasts. And of course, all the other wonderful shows. We've got four shows going now almost uh, every week. You've got one embargo, pipe dummies, cigar chat, and sharing our pairing. So uh, we've got a lot of content out there. You can always pick it up on podcast if you don't catch it live. And of course, uh, you know, shout out to our YouTube channel because we've got all the videos there if you want to check out our ugly mugs as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, before we know it, we'll be uh, posting up another 70 or 80 interviews from IPCPR as well. So, That's com uh, it's coming up quick. I mean, you know, we're still, what, four or five months away, but it's, it, when we come down to it, it's, it seems to have come faster and faster every year. It's quick, man. I mean, I'm looking at my calendar, and uh, I've got a trip coming up at the beginning of next month. And then um, for i got a family thing going out to North Carolina and D.C. and uh, New York City in May. Um, and then it's going to be to Vegas in July. It's going to be here before we know it. So, um, I think we learned a lot from last year as far as, uh, you know, based ways to, uh, better manage the time. So we're not up at three in the morning processing video. Um, that's not going to happen this year. Uh, so the video might come out a little bit slower than it did last year. We're not just going to throw stuff up haphazardly, but, uh, all the content will get up and, uh, hopefully we'll get some, some better content because, <laughs> we'll be fresh. <laughs> yeah, we'll be fresh. And we'll be always looking to push the envelope. So you never know what we've got in store for the next show. But um, as we say, uh, thanks for tuning in. And uh, everyone out there, make sure to drink better and drink less. <laughs>